Thank you. It's with you, David. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you, Mary, for, for praying for me. M much appreciated. And uh, thank you, Linda, for, 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 your, uh, for your reading. A very good from an enigma. I can only describe the verses that we've had read to us as old friends. They never fail to amaze me or warm my heart. And it's a real privilege to uh, be able to bring them to you this morning. I, I first met these verses some 50 years ago, and they were an important stepping stone in my becoming a Christian. And they form the first link in a, a chain of verses I keep in my Bible for helping to explain salvation to, to others. Paul's letter to Romans has had a great significance and impact on the church over the years and an impact on countless believers of all ages and over all ages. And it's inspired the lives of great leaders and church reformers. The famous preacher, um, which I suspect, I'm not sure how many people have heard of him by now, from the 1960s, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached a whole series of sermons on Romans at the Westminster Chapel. And later they were to form the basis for his commentary on Romans, which uh, took up an amazing 14 volumes. Now, needless to say, I've not read them um, in preparation uh, for this sermon, but I have been influenced very much by the writings of John Stott, and, and Timothy Keller. And for those of you who are sort of just looking a bit worried, I won't be delving into Martin Lloyd Jones's 14 volumes. So Sunday lunch will not be delayed. The passage that Linda read to us has been called very much the centre and heart of the whole letter to the Romans. And one theologian, Dr. Liam Morris, has suggested quite amazingly, it may be possibly the most important paragraph ever written, which is quite, quite a, a, a thing to say about, I mean, Paul's writings are great, as you know, but to say this one paragraph was so important is quite, quite an, an amazing thing. So this morning, I want to look um, together at two things, the problem and God's solution. So first of all, what is the most fundamental problem of mankind? Now, many years ago, um, the Times newspaper posed the question, what is wrong with the world? A letter appeared in reply, and I'm sure many of you know this, written by the author G.K. Chesterton. And he wrote quite simply and profoundly, what is wrong with the world? I am, yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And I think that that sums it up perfectly. Paul described the fundamental problem of mankind in this way. In Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All human beings, whatever race, rank, creed, culture, religious or irreligious, are without exception sinful, guilty, and have no excuse before God. And Romans 6, 23 reminds us the wages, the penalty of sin, is death. And that's spiritual death, eternal separation from God. It is the human predicament. Bishop Hanley Mall, which I can't, an amazing name for an amazing man, I think. But Bishop Hanley Mall wrote, the prostitute, the liar, the murderer 
are all short of God's glory, but so are we. He illustrated this in a, a rather interesting imaginary scale. He said it is as if the people mentioned the worst of all are at the bottom of a mine shaft. And perhaps we are on the top of the Alps. But we as, are as little able to touch the stars as they are. He's describing the gulf there is between us and God. We may not be at the bottom of the mine shaft. We may be on the Alps, but we can't reach God. We are all short of that glory. And I suppose a more con contemporary illustration would be God's pass mark is 100%. The standard we have to live as is the same as that as a life of as, as, as Jesus lived. He had the 100% pass mark. The thing is, unlike the government and modern exams, the pass mark can't be adjusted. God's pass mark to a place in heaven applies to us all and does not change and cannot be moved up or down to make sure more people get to heaven. We cannot reach that pass mark and that is the dilemma we face. But what is God's solution? How is the dilemma this problem poses resolved? How can God be both loving and just? How can he see that the penalties of his law are kept and be merciful, laying them aside? Well, the answer is found in the second part of Romans 3.24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. The great news, the good news, the answer is, as I'm sure most of us know, the answer is a free gift. And it's because of the cross that it's a free and applicable to us all. Let's look at verse 24 in a little bit more detail. Just perhaps to get clear some of the words that are being used. Firstly, all have sinned. To sin comes from the Greek word, it's an archery term, and it means to miss the mark, a falling short of the perfect score. And as we said, we all miss the mark. Second thing is, we are all are justified freely and that that really makes my heart sing justification as is a legal term and it belongs to the law courts um, it's the opposite of condemnation and it's not just pardon to justify is to declare someone as righteous and justify means as i'm sure many of you know it means I am just as if I'd never sinned. I'll just repeat that. It means just as if I've never sinned. It, the amazing thing is that my record, my slate has been wiped clean. The video record of all the sins, all the things that I've done wrong is totally erased if we were just pardoned the record would still stand but we're forgiven and the past is as god says completely gone he says in the new testament i will remember your sins no more and we are justified freely by his grace and as i said that that is so that is great news especially if you're someone that struggled with guilt and wanting to get things right all your life you're justified justification is not something we earn or work through but it's freely given to us 
it's a gift of grace. We need to remember God does not give us what we deserve, but gives us his free, unmerited favour. Now we know that other religions and philosophies say that if our record is good enough, we would be worthy of a life with whatever God we worship. We can only be accepted if we've done, if we've led a, a, a good life, if things that we've done enough, we've in a sense gained enough heavenly brownie points to get us into heaven. But it's not like that. The gospel, the good news, is that God has developed a perfect righteousness and he offers it to us and by it we are accepted. It's the complete reverse of what every, every other religion, philosophy and human heart believes. And I think it really never fails to amaze me. I mean, uh, even you know, if you look, if I look at my own life, there is so much that I'm so glad that God has forgotten and forgiven. So then, how does justification come to sinful people? Well, then I think there are four answers to that question. First of all, as we've said, and I hope you're beginning to remember, and I know what I'm saying this morning will be mainly a, a reminder for most people. Justification cannot come through our own actions. We've said several times, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have lost that glory because of our sin or rebellion. And we cannot live in God's presence and enjoy his approval. Justification is freely given. And that's, that's important because it is possible even to think of faith as a kind of work. We need to remember we can't work for it. We can't have some ephemeral feeling about God or that's good enough. Or we just have to say the right words as we pray or do the right things or even attend church. Well, when we could, standing in church no longer makes me, no more makes me a Christian than standing in my garage makes me a car. It's not where we are. It's who we are. It's not what we do. It's who we know. Doing the right things is not enough. But justification that God gives us does mean we are now free to choose to do the right things. If that makes sense. We don't, we don't do things to earn salvation, but because we're free, we are saved, we are justified, we're free to do the right things. Justification, as we've said, comes through faith, and it's faith in Jesus. Verse 22 says, this righteousness from God comes through sorry, faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And it's not faith in itself that saves, but faith in Jesus Christ, him only. And, and this is one of the things that again flies in the way face of modern thinking you know they can people can say well if you follow your religion and you follow whoever is the leader of that religion that that will get you to god there's loads of roads to god well no there isn't and it makes it's a very unpopular thing there is only one way to god to jesus and that to god that's through jesus it's not faith that saves, but faith in Jesus Christ and him only. Sometimes we sort of say, oh, to have, you, as long as someone's got a vague faith, it's enough. 
but it's not enough. There's no point being vague in your faith. Perhaps most importantly, justification comes through faith in Christ's work on the cross, not simply as an admiration of Jesus as a great man or a great teacher, or even trying, as we've said, to keep his teachings. I mean, often you hear people say, well, I, I, I try to keep the Sermon on the Mount, and, and they can't, it's not possible. Our righteousness is through Christ and him crucified. And I think an illustration that I suspect many people have heard before, it's as if we're in court and we're in the dock, and the charges are read out, and I know that the police amongst us will know this a bit better than most. The charges are read out, and the evidence is presented, and the judge pronounces us guilty, and the penalty of our crimes is death. Then, to our utter amazement, the judge steps down, stands beside us, and says, You are free to go. I will take the penalty, I will die in your place. And that is exactly what Jesus did for each of us on the cross. The one who judge, who will judge, the one who knows and sees we are guilty, died on the cross in our place. And the wonder of the cross is that, is that just with one stroke, God satisfied both his love and his justice. It shows us that God is the judge who cares enough about the world to set standards and holds us to them. And he's also the justifier who has done everything to forgive us and restore us. Now, despite this good news, it's the sort of perverse thing of human nature that we still struggle at times to accept these things. And there are three, three barriers, I think, at least. We think sometimes we're good enough that we do not need to be forgiven and can easily make excuses for ourselves and we can cry it's not my fault the way I am. I remember I've, I've spoken about my friend Caroline a few times and I, I said she was quite instrumental in me becoming a Christian and I remember in one of the uh, I, it's funny how some of the things that get lodged in your mind I remember in one of our conversations when I was sort of feeling a, a little bit less uh, haughty than normal um, I, I did say to, to Carolyn, I'm sure I can creep into heaven by the back door, which uh, was, I thought was very, uh, very humble of me, but uh, totally wrong, because there is no back door. There is only one way, and that's the Lord Jesus. And we still, I think, try to earn salvation out of our human pride. We cannot admit we're not good enough for heaven on our own merits. And we try very hard times to keep God's law. Um, I mean, again, from my own, I remember a silly example from my own life is I remember as a very young, uh, young person counting up the number of times I said the Lord's Prayer in the week, because we used to do it. Uh, at school and I, I worked out that I, I said the Lord's Prayer at least um, sort of nine times a week if I went to church as well but it we couldn't it's obviously a nonsense and Romans 3.20 makes it very clear therefore no one will be declared righteous by observing observing the law oh, the bit. And finally, I think we think that a loving God will not judge us or other people, especially those who think 
of doing and leading good lives. God does not set his justice aside. He turns it on himself. Um, and Timothy Keller has written that this sentence, which I think is quite profound. God is a father worth having and a father we can have. So, applications. There are <laughs> lots of applications, probably more than the sermon, but um, I think, first of all, as a believer, do we let the fact that we're justified freely by his grace motivate and liberate our lives and influence what we do? Now, I think the people we are, sometimes we do not feel righteous or forgiven. And I think at the beginning, we have to realize that it's not feelings that are important, but it's the facts. It's the facts that Jesus has died for us and paid the price, and the slate has been wiped clean that is so important. And as we accept that and work that out, it will become reality in our thinking, in our lives. It's not feelings, it's what Jesus has done and the promises in the Bible. Do we let the knowledge of this grace lead us both to worship and to prayers of gratitude for what he's saved us from? He saved us, as Paul said last week, from the wrath of God. In the words of Wesley's hymn, Amazing grace. How precious does that grace appear? Another application is, do we show the same grace we've received in our relationships with others? I'd like to also sort of, in my sort of thinking of how we apply God's work, set out a challenge. Could you explain the love of Jesus and the way of salvation to someone who wanted to know just using the Bible? The only tool you have, as it were, is an open Bible. Could you take that Bible and lead them to the Lord Jesus through just verses of Scripture? There's a very simple way of doing that. And... Uh, if you want to know a little bit more, please let me know and uh, I can share with you uh, something that was shown to me years ago and has been with me ever since. However, I think the most important and obvious application has to be, have we accepted the Lord's offer of salvation, the free gift of forgiveness? and a place in heaven to know him as Heavenly Father? Or are we still trying to earn acceptance and our place in heaven? Are we still pursued by guilt and not knowing that we're forgiven? We may have been a churchgoer for some time, but still do not know our Heavenly Father in a very personal way. The question I'd like to ask is, is this the day we come home to him or we come back to him? Is this the day that we accept all that he's done for us on that cross? To repeat the words of Timothy Keller, God is a father worth having and a father we can have. I'd like uh, just to close by praying, praying for over some of these things and praying for us all. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning 
of the amazing gospel that we are justified and we are righteous and that you have cleansed our slates there's no record you will remember our sins no more father we acknowledge that we have things in our lives that need forgiveness father want to ask lord that you would help us to know you better and if we don't know you father lord that you would show yourself to us I really want to pray for those who know that you've forgiven them given that find it hard to forgive themselves I want to pray for those lord who are still struggling under a bondage of having to try and earn salvation father lord again all we can do is thank you for that uh, salvation so freely given in jesus amen and i think uh, just like to conclude that if you are not sure where you stand with the lord if you feel that you would like to talk over some of these things please contact some of the church leadership um, or, or give me a phone or an email and i'm sure there's there or, or someone that you know there are many people that would love to share and pray with you right that's it thank you so much david let me just stop the recording a minute